So just to start with an outline, first I'll introduce the work. Um, then I'll talk about what model comparison is, just very, very generally, uh, why it's useful. Um, I'll talk about space, space filling curves, um, including the Hilbert curve and the uh, z-order curve, which is also known as the Lebesgue curve. And uh, let's see, and then I'll, I'll uh, talk about the algorithms that exist to um, transform back and forth between the z-order curve and real coordinates. Uh, finally, I'll talk about a, a, uh, a real example that we, we assess the method with in basis, which is the uh, Lansosh uh, separation of exponential decays problem. And uh, finally, I'll conclude the talk. Okay. So the idea behind basis is uh, we want to do model comparison for models with atomic priors. So that means you have um, a model equation that is a sum of some components that are all uh, identical in structure. And these, um, the parameters in each component must have identical priors. So I'll give you an example once we get to the example section. Um, so it uses a uh, space filling curve to sample n-dimensional distributions using uh, one-dimensional sampling techniques. It makes use of several different sampling techniques, uh, but they all benefit from this uh, one-dimension, one-dimensional to n-dimensional uh, mapping. Uh, so the Hilbert curve is the space filling curve that's built in to basis. Um, uh, but we think that the z-order curve is a, is a, fest a faster and uh, thus a better alternative. So um, there are two, two main ways you can do the z-order curve transformations. There's the brute force way, and where you just uh, basically interleave the bits one by one of each of the numbers or coordinates. And then there's a mask-based approach, which is a little cleverer, and in some implementations, much faster. Um, so then, like I said, I'm going to talk about the, uh, that Lantzosch uh, separation of exponential decays problem. And so that demonstrates that this, this particular method is effective both in precision and in time performance. Okay, so let's talk about model comparison. So model comparison gives us a way to consistently and rationally compare models for data using probability. There are several ways you can go about doing this. Um, there's two main classes of techniques for uh, numerically um, evaluating model probabilities. Uh, one way you can do it is doing it one model at a time. And techniques for doing this include uh, nested sampling, uh, thermodynamic integration, and uh, variational methods. There are also other techniques. Also, you can do, um, there are techniques you can use which look at all models at once and sample the joint distribution over uh, the entire combined parameter space for all the models. Uh, such techniques include uh, reversible jump Markov chain Monte Carlo and uh, jump, diffusion, <laughs> jump diffusion sampling. So as I said before, uh, BASIS uh, works uh, with atomic priors only. So if uh, it's uh, unlike reversible jump mon or MCMC, you can't uh, do a generalized um, all models at once approach. It needs to be atomic. Um, and it combines several methods for uh, carrying out the, uh, the model comparison calculations. So, um, you know, at the heart, it uses jump diffusion sampling, which uh, allows it to have, to move, to, to add atoms in the atomic models, or um, delete atoms, or sample within them. And the jump diffusion sampling kind of prescribes the, the way that works. Uh, it also uses thermodynamic, thermodynamic integration, uh, not, to, not to necessarily give you the evidence, um, but it uh, uses that to, to ease the process of going from the uh, prior to the posterior distribution and uh, sampling from that. Um, it also uses um, several different um, sampling techniques kind of within, within the jump diffusion process. Uh, so binary slice sampling is one of those. It uses several others. Uh, and binary slice sampling really only works in one dimension. So if you want to attack a problem that has uh, more than one parameter in each atom, then you're going to need some way to represent 
uh, those parameters uh, with a one-dimensional index. And space filling curves uh, give us the means to do that. OK, so what is a space filling curve? A space filling curve uh, is in, well, in the uh, context we're looking at it here, a space filling curve is a function that maps um, one dimensional natural numbers, the set of one dimensional natural numbers, to the n dimensional set of natural numbers. Um, so, just, and, and it needs to be, in this case, it needs to be bi directional. Um, some of the other desired properties we want from a function like this is it needs to kind of maintain locality. So that means if, if two points on your space filling curve are close, then the corresponding points in space need to also be relatively close. Um, the algorithms to do the transformations also need to be time efficient. And uh, like I said, we want to be able to go back and forth between the curve indices and um, real, the real parameter space. So here's an image of the Hilbert curve. So as you can see, it starts over here at 0, 0, and snakes its way all the way through the parameter space, and ends over here at 15, uh, 0. And this gives us, um, as you can see, this gives us a way to, if you, if you look at the index along the curve, that gives you a way to represent any point in this two-dimensional space with a one-dimensional value. Okay, so this is an image of the z-order curve, which is the curve that I propose to use instead. And as you can probably tell, it is called the z-order curve because, well, it looks like a bunch of z's uh, backwards. But um, I, just like the Hilbert curve, it you know, covers the entire space going from, this case, in this case, 0, 0, 0, up to uh, 15 and 15. And so that is the z-order curve. It is, I do want to mention that the Hilbert curve um, has the nice property that if two indices are adjacent on the Hilbert curve, then they are, or if they're consecutive on the Hilbert curve, then they're adjacent in space. So that's a nice property that the z-order curve doesn't necessarily have. You have some big jumps, like right here. But um, those don't uh, end up hurting you too much. OK, so let's talk about the simple way to do the z-order curve transformation algorithms. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the, how you will go from your, your axes coordinates to your Hilbert, I mean your z-order curve line indexes. So the basic process is that you just need to interleave the bits of the, uh, of the axis coordinates to form your line integer. So, and the way this goes about it is to do a couple of nested loops over the number of uh, dimensions in and the number of bits per dimension b, and then set each uh, bit of the line integer using the appropriate bits from the uh, axis coordinates. So this gives you an algorithm with a time complexity of O of n times b. And the reverse, the line to axes algorithm, is very similar. Uh, you do your nested, nested for loops over n and b again. Uh, and except this time, instead of interleaving, you're deinterleaving. And you are building up the line, or you're building up the axes coordinates based on the bits in the line representation. So this has the same time complexity. So the more interesting way to do this, and the uh, faster in some implementations way of doing this, is to use uh, bit shifts and bit masks. Um, so this was inspired by some um, uh, various, various posts that were <laughs> by several authors on, on the internet. Um, one user on Stack Overflow had the most comprehensive sort of way of uh, looking at this, and they actually had some code for generating uh, the bit masks that you need in, um, for an arbitrary number of dimensions and an arbitrary number of bits per dimension. Um, the vast majority of the discussion dealing with the z-order curve is in the case of two dimensions because it's dealing with image process and processing and things like that. But we need, as we need an arbitrary number of dimensions and an arbitrary number of bits. 
So that, uh, that post helped out a lot. And the specific citation is in the paper. So. Um, so the masks are computed ahead of time. They depend only on the number of bits per dimension and the number of dimensions. The, um, you end up having about log b on the order of log b masks. And so the time complexity of these algorithms is about um, O of n times log b. So next I'm going to show a, an example of the line to, axi line to axes process for using these bit masks. Okay. So in this case, in this example, we have 16 bits per dimension and two dimensions. So you're going to start out, since we're starting with the line integer, that's a 32-bit integer. Okay. So the first thing we do is apply uh, the first mask. So we take x and and it with that first mask and take the result. And what that ends up doing is basically zeroing out every other bit in the integer. So the places where you see dashes, those are, those are implied to be zeros. And the places where you see numbers and letters, those are labels for the remaining bits. All right, so next, we shift x over to the right by one, and then XOR it with itself. And that basically has the effect of uh, duplicating everything to the right by one bit. You apply the next mask, and then you end up basically moving every other bit that's still left over to the right by one. So we repeat this, repeat this process, you know, shifting to the right by two, XORing with itself again, end up with more duplicates, apply the next mask, and then you end up uh, moving every other pair of bits to the right by two bits and removing the duplicates. So we do this again for a shift for four, and for the next mask, we end up with this. And with one more application of the same process, we end up having moved everything over. And this is our uh, axes coordinate for the first, for the first dimension. So if you wanted to do this for the second axis coordinate, you'd start out by shifting everything to the right by one bit and then applying this mask, and then you'd end up getting the second dimension. All right, so let's move on to an example. So as I said, I use the uh, Lantzosch uh, separation of exponential decays problem. So in his original, in his uh, book from the 50s on analysis, he uh, presents this problem as an example of um, some of the limits of numerical techniques. If, in, in his example, he only presents 24 data points for this function, and um, they are rounded to do two decimal places, and he demonstrates that uh, even, even using analysis and without using numerical techniques, you can only recover two of the exponentials that are present instead of the three that you can see here. Uh, so when uh, O'Rani and uh, Fitzgerald presented it in their 1996 book. They included um, data up to four decimal places truncated. And in, this, in that situation, you can actually recover all three exponentials. So we wanted to kind of repeat that problem with this, or with this method and basis to see if it worked just as well as the Hilbert curve method. Okay, so just the details of my implementation. We used 100 objects in the ensemble of basis objects, uh, a rate of 0.1, used a Gaussian likelihood with uh, a standard deviation of 1 10,000th, uh, uniform priors for the parameters, well, uniform priors for the amplitude parameters, and uh, then a uniform prior on the inverse of the decayed parameters, so that's effectively a sort of a, a limited Jeffries prior on that decay parameter. Um, an unbounded geometric prior for the number of atoms, and then we did 100 runs each for the Hilbert curve, the simple z-order curve, and the mask-based z-order curve. And the results are based on those 100 runs. So here we see a, you know, the, basically the spread of the, of the mean number of atoms that basis came up with based on those settings, and um, over 100 runs for each method. So as you can see, the Hilbert curve found um, a mean, mean number of atoms of about 3.2. So that's pretty close to the, uh, what, we, what we set it as with uh, three present. Um, and both of the z-order curve methods 
both had means that were very close. Um, so in this case, or what we can, what we can glean, glean from this basically is that the, the z-order curve methods in this particular problem ended up um, not performing any worse than the Hilbert curve method. So that's really all we need in this case. All right, now the time chart tells a little different story because we have, um, we see with the Hilbert curve, we took about 150 seconds as a mean um, running time. Whereas with the simple z order curve method, we saw a running time of a little less than 120 seconds um, on average. Uh, now, a little unexpectedly, the mask-based mask based method was actually slower than the simple method, uh, but still a little bit faster than the Hilbert curve. Um, and in this case, I think that um, what caused that was the, my, my, particu my particular implementation of this within basis, which, um, so the, the method with the masks involves bit shifts, and with the way that basis in, er, represents its long integers, uh, that means I have to do uh, compute um, explicit carries for each of these bit shifts operations, and that ends up taking up a bunch of time. So in, in other contexts, this mass-based approach would probably end up doing a little better. But anyway, the, um, the simple z-order simple, simple z order curve method ended up performing, performing really well. Okay. So in conclusion, in our example, uh, basis with the z-order curve is uh, faster and just as precise as basis with the Hilbert curve. Um, this, the brute force approach with the explicit bit interleaving and deinterleaving is uh, faster than the bit mass method in this implementation, uh, but in other implementations that I haven't shown here, <laughs> it ends up being um, more efficient and there are likely more efficient ways to do it than the way I did it in basis. But the upshot is, um, it's something interesting to check out. So, thank you very much. <laughs>